one is right. Is it evidence that we love God and that we're right with Him if we're rich? Or is it evidence that we love God and we're right with Him if everything we have we give away in order to ensure that others are okay? Which is the right one? Should we as Christians assume that following these biblical principles will guarantee us prosperity? Should we assume that? Or does God so despise prosperity and property that we're supposed to give it all up? It's a pretty profound question. It's very, very open and in the discussion today. Everywhere you turn, you hear about this. And you know, last week we learned that there are over 2,000 verses in the Bible that actually talk about giving on one level or another. So with that many verses concerning a topic, you'd kind of expect a variety of conclusions, right? You'd kind of expect people to come to different stances. And that's why people from both of those stances can look at you and quote verse, chapter, and book. It's very common to say, well, you know, you can come to our church because we just preach the Bible. Everybody believes that. Everybody thinks they're preaching the Bible. If that were true, why aren't we all saying the same things? You follow what I'm saying? In fact, let's make this even harder to understand to show you how difficult it can be in defense of these sincere, sincere teachers who are in disagreement. They're really trying their best, but they come up with a different stance. Look at two different passages written by the same man. John, the beloved, wrote this passage that says, Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. Sounds a whole lot like poverty, doesn't it? If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in him. And then you get John in the second passage that we're going to look at in his third epistle, verse 2, that says, Dear friend, I pray that you may prosper in every way and be in good health physically just as you are spiritually. That sounds a whole lot like prosperity, doesn't it? The same godly man says, do not love the world or the things of the world. And he turns around and says, I want you to prosper. And he's not talking about spiritual prosper, spiritually prospering, because that's understood in the verse, right? He says, health physically just as you already are spiritually. So it's understood that there's a spiritual prosperity there. Now, do you see why there's some confusion? It can be a little confusing, can it? Well, here's what Jesus had to say. So this is what's certain. No one can be a slave to two masters. Since he will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of both God and money. Father God, as we look into your word today and we truly seek your face, make yourself known to us today and help us to find you in the midst of all the confusion around us about, about being a steward and managing life and living successfully. God, we really truly do want to learn from you to manage our lives so that we can live successfully, but not successfully as the world sees it, but God, successfully as you see it. So God, just jump in the middle of our teaching today and guide us for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that word master right there that he uses means absolute ownership. No one can be absolutely owned by God and by money. So what he's saying is, look, materialism can't be the absolute power in your life, and you at the same time claim to have God as the Lord of your life. Does this make sense? You can't say, oh man, I'm just out to get mine and prosper and do better and make make a living, do well, have the, 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 all the amenities of life, and at the same time say, well, but, you know, God is the Lord of my life. Jesus is saying you can't do both of those. It's impossible. And there's three words to me that describe this owner-slave relationship. The first one is choice. The first one's choice. Jesus is teaching us we choose who we serve. How many of you believe that? I get to choose who I serve. I totally believe that. Some of us are slaves to what the world offers, right? Some of us are slaves to materialism. And let me just tell you, living in America, it's hard not to get caught up in that. Especially if you're a 20-something or a 30-something and you're starting to raise some kids and, and your children go to school with kids who have things that they don't and they don't understand and da 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 right? It's very hard in America when everything we see and we're inundated constantly with messages of materialism, it's hard not to get caught up in that. In fact, it is the American way, and there ain't nothing wrong with America. I love it here. And there's nothing wrong with your things like we talked about last week. But you have to choose who you serve. What is it that you serve? What's the Lord of your life? Some of us are slave to what the world offers, materialism. Others are slaves to God. Today, I want you to answer that question for yourself. But none of us are both. You have to choose Jesus. The second thing is control. Jesus is teaching us that our chosen master will have absolute ownership over us and we'll be in control of our lives. Have you thought about that? What you serve, your master, what you choose to be serving, right? What you choose to have as your master has absolute control over your life, even if you don't perceive it to be so. 
By the end of the day, I think you're going to find that that's the truth, though. And the third thing is confidence. Why is this so important? Because Jesus is teaching us that we will place our confidence, our trust, our dependence in the master that we choose. That makes perfect sense too, right? If I choose something as my master, what I'm saying is I trust it, I depend upon it, I absolutely believe in it. Some translations, and yours may, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands in a moment, in your translations, how many of your Bibles tr capitalize the word mammon or money in that text? Anybody have it that capitalizes it? Do you know why some translations capitalize that word mammon or money? Because the translators looked at it and said, you know what? If we devote our time, our resources, our energy to it, it becomes like a God to us. And so they're trying to help us to understand that if we're not careful, materialism can become our God. And it goes without saying in God's economy that if it is what we look to and serve and choose and, and is controlling us and where we place our confidence, it is our God. And it's an idol, but it is our God. The law teaches that plainly. Jesus didn't say, no, here's some, here, a, little bit of, a little bit of, hmm, Jesus didn't say you can't serve, or, or let me rephrase. He didn't say you cannot serve both God and money. In other words, it's impossible for you to be slaves to both. That's an issue of control, right? He didn't say you must not serve God or money. He didn't say let me give you some advice. Try not to serve God, right? It's not like a, well, here, if you really want to, you know, let me advise you or, or let me just kind of help you. Because if he said you should not be slaves to God and money, that would be an issue of advisability. It's not advisable that you be a slave to God and money. Both. Right? That's not what he said. And if he said you must not, it would be an issue of accountability. But that's not what he said either, is it? What did he say? He said you cannot serve both God and money. In other words, it's impossible. It can't be done. It is not something that you can claim to do and be right about it. It's impossible for you to be a slave to both things. We talked about this last week in a spousal relationship, but uh, how many of you, uh, let's say you're an employer. Let's say you own a, an electrical company. That's a good place to start. We have an electrician here. And let's say you've got a company manager who is working for you, and he comes to you and says, you know what, I want to also work for comp company B, and I want to be a manager for them too. But look, I, I can do this. I can be totally fair to both. Nothing will cross over. I will serve you 100%, and I'll serve them 100%. Is that possible? Well, of course it isn't possible. Can you play on both football teams on the field at any given time? We know that's silly, and yet we think in our minds, well, you know, I can manage this. I can put these things first. I can, I can, I can let them control me and, and let them have a, be my first choice, and I can place my confidence there. But in the end, I, I can still be God's child. I can still be a child of God that can call him my Lord. It makes just as much sense to believe the other one. Is it any wonder that Solomon said, whoever loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. You know people that are very, very well off and it seems like nothing's ever enough and they're killing themselves to have more stuff and you can say as sure as you're standing here, now they would never agree with you, but you can say, you know what, they're really miserable. They're not happy. Because they're not contented. It's hard to be happy if you're not content, isn't it? Now, how do you know whom you serve? How do you know where you're placing your choices? How do you know who has control of your life? And how do you know where you're placing your confidence? Two things. Your calendar. Talked about this last week. What do you spend your time doing? And I'm not talking about the times where you have to do certain things. I'm not talking about the time when you're working. I'm not talking about the times when you're in school. What do you spend your leisure time doing? pretty good indicator of what you're being controlled by, what you've chosen, what you depend upon. The obvious second one is what? Your calendar and your, your checkbook. What do you spend your money on? The key word's being spend in both of those things. Is that a fair statement to say, well, you know, wherever you spend your time and your money is really where you're placing your choice and your trust and your dependence. That's, as much as we hate to admit it, that's really what your God is. Let's call it this. That's an idol for you because we'd never really intentionally put a God before God. We wouldn't do that, would we? I wouldn't. And yet, anytime God's not front and center and in the center of your, of your whole being, then he is taking a back seat to some fashion of an idol, even if it's just yourself. So what we're really talking about is this idea of materialism, right? What is materialism defined as? Here's the definition of it. It's the theory that physical well-being and worldly possessions constitutes the highest value and the greatest good in life. Right? Materialism says, man, what you have, what you get, 
your success in those things is really the highest value in life. That's when you know you've arrived. You know people like that? Their whole existence is wrapped up in the things they're trying to get or the things that they already have and trying to get something better than that. I know a lot of people like that. And yet, the Gallups, the Gallups, a Gallup poll was done. A Gallup poll was done that said the criteria that indicate personal success in America were these. Number one, good health. Number two, an enjoyable job. Number three, a happy family. Number four, a good education. Number five, peace of mind. Number six, good friends. Now, what is it there? Materialism is not there. So somehow or another, in the midst of all these messages that we're being inundated with, if this is true of what people out there really think, then at least there's hope because we haven't gone hook, line, and sinker into this materialistic idea. So back to our, our thought for today. We wanted to define materialism because in reality, this poverty and prosperity thing is all about how you view what we just talked about. So let's contrast these two stances. Poverty theology. You may want to make a couple of notes here. Uh, and this will help you to know where you're really at, because this snuck up on me a little bit. I realized that I had a little bit of both of these in me, and I didn't realize it. Uh, in poverty theology, possessions are a curse, right? The rest scripture would be Luke 18, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and Jesus said, look, after having a debate about the fact that the kid said he kept the law perfectly his whole life, right? He really didn't understand Jesus. But Jesus said, here's what I want you to do then. I want you to sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Did Jesus say that? He said it. Did he say it to a rich person? He said it. That's their scripture. They reject possessions, and their attitude toward poverty is that it is proof that they are in God's will. The more poor they are, the more obvious it is that God loves them and is blessing them. They are preoccupied with daily needs, however. Why? Because they don't have them. It's a hand-to-mouth existence. Now let's look at this prosperity idea. Prosperity and possessions are a right. They're our right if we're righteous. Think about what I just said now. If I'm righteous and I do the right things, prosperity, property, possessions are my right. I have a right to them. It sounds a lot like entitlement, doesn't it? You know what their scripture would be? Matthew 7. Ask, seek, knock, and what? You'll get, get, get. They move past wants, though, I mean, past needs to wants, don't they? It's way beyond what God provides in their needs. That's nothing. I'm, I, I deserve that. It's all about what's wanted. And their prosperity view is that they possess everything themselves. This is my stuff. This is mine. I worked hard for this. I'm the one that did this. If they have a financial, financial desire for something that they don't have, the prosperity folks, more often than not, will do what's called planting a seed. How many of you have been asked this? Have you planted a seed for this? You'll hear this a lot. If you start paying attention, you'll hear this a lot from this, this field of theology. And what that planting a seed really says is you give to someone who is right with God X amount, and they will give you, and you will get back exponentially more than what you gave. Does that sound like people on TV now? Does it make sense? If you'll give me X, you'll get back double X. Now that sounds like American teaching. Give it to a person of faith and you'll receive more. It's almost like an investment. It's almost like God is this internal investment plan. Because why? These people will tell you, look, it's God's will that you not be poor. It is not God's will that anybody would ever be poor. They're so preoccupied with money, they're constantly driven to get it. Those are the two stances. Now, obviously, let's shoot right in the middle. Let's talk about the idea of what a steward would believe. Stewardship would believe this. It would take the best of both of those and discard them. Are there good points about these two things? Yes. Yes, we should want to give to the poor. We should want to work hard and gain so that we can give. We should want to do those things. But in the stewardship theology, the perspective is that possessions are a trust given in varying proportions. We'll talk more deeply about this next week. But essentially what it says is the things that I have were given to me, and I don't have a control over how much I got and how much they got and how much she got. I don't have a control over that. All I can be accountable for is what was given to me. And it's a privilege. Whatever I have 
I'm privileged to have it. Sounds a whole lot like my mom and daddy's generation and really sounds like the generation before theirs. Be thankful for what you've got. They ask this, what have you received? And they believe in proportionate giving based on what you receive. That's what a stewardship theologian believes. You don't plant a seed. You don't plant seeds. God's not an eternal investment plan. What you do is you give, you manage what you have, and God will bless you for managing and giving of what he's given you. And it is reciprocal, but it's a totally different way of looking at it. Here's what a steward would believe. God's will is not known by your assets or lack thereof. You can't prove whether you're with God or not based on what you have. It's not how it works. They would say, ask for wisdom about being faithful with what you do have. Now, somewhere in these three, we need to land today as a church. Because next week, we're going to ask our church to do some pretty cool things. But before we get to that, we need to nail down what we talked about last week, and we need to nail down what we're talking about today. Now, let me give you four problems with poverty theology, okay? Four problems with it. Number one is the presumption that anyone doing well financially must be doing something wrong. You ever felt like that? Man, there ain't no way that person's living for God. Look at all that stuff they got. Hey, we can't help but find <laughs> We kind of find, you know what I'm saying. We kind of stumble into that sometimes. But look, the well-off are either dishonest in the way they got it or would give it all up if they really love God. That's the problem with poverty theology. The, what they need to read is Proverbs 22, 2 that says this, the rich and the poor have this in common, the Lord is the maker of them all. Another problem with poverty theology is it exaggerates the role of sacrificial work. Is it important to sacrifice? Of course it's important to sacrifice, but it isn't a God. They're usually very legalistic. Do you know folks like this that are kind of into this poverty thing? There's been some very prominent pastors who I respect dearly who have went this way, left churches, gave up everything because they said, you know what, I, I should be giving everything to the poor. Now, they didn't give everything to the poor. They kept the proceeds from the books they wrote, but they walked, yeah, right? If you've kept up with some of the more popular theologians of the last 10 years, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you can name this man. You know who he is, and he's a great guy. He's a fantastic preacher. But these people are usually legalistic because they assume sacrifice makes them more spiritual and it causes them to earn God's love in a greater sense. Sounds familiar, right? Man, the more I give, the more God's going to love me and the more spiritual I'm going to be. But does giving increase spirituality? No. And here's what, impor more importantly, is that why God loves you? It's not why God loves me. God loves me just because it's unqualified. Otherwise, I would be unlovable. And they can become arrogant and see themselves as measuring sticks for spirituality. Right? It's also extremely naive. Think about this. Their resources come from people who didn't give it all up. You connect the dots, right? Business people. Poverty says, give everything away and take care of the poor and God will take care of you. Well, how's God going to take care of you? People that didn't give everything up. So it kind of goes without saying, it's a sort of naive idea. If everyone gave up everything, who would support you? They don't look at it like that, though, right? They would be out of business. I know Christians who I love dearly who won't invest in a retirement plan because they think God's just going to miraculously care for them in their old age. If that's where you're at, great. Great. It's not where I'm at, though. I think we give God back what a percentage of what he's given to us. It's extremely naive. And lastly, you know what else? You, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get an amen out of this because you've been in these prayer groups. It can be really manipulative lifestyle. You ever been in that group where this person, I got a prayer request, which is code for what? Anybody in here want to take me to raise? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Every time you go into Bible study, every time you go into a prayer group, you spend a percentage of your time listening to so-and-so's problems. And the reason why that's going on is because they hope that you'll swoop down and take care of them. Should we take care of people that are lesser, blessed than us? Of course we should. But is that the motivation behind doing it? That's what you have to answer for yourself. Now, there's also three problems with this prosperity idea. These folks believe that it's a sign of God's approval. God's blessings of you proves that he loves you. 
Now, this could lead to arrogance over what they have, right? Not over what they don't have. This could lead to arrogance over what you have because you could say, oh, my goodness, God really loves me because I'm rich. That's what the religious faithful in Jesus' era believed, by the way. When Jesus came to earth, the assumption and all the people around him was, well, the wealthy are obviously right with God because they've been blessed. Is it any wonder God went to the poor through Jesus? So it's a sign of God's approval. Write this one down if you don't write down anything else. You know what it does? If you're one of these people that believes that God loves you so much he gave you a lot of stuff, can I talk to you about the guilt that that produces with other people? Think about this for a second. What about the folks who love God who don't have as much as you? Now let's extend this a little bit because this is about more than possessions. Let's just just talk about healing for a second. Oh, if you really love God and you're really faithful, he'll heal you. Well, what if he didn't? What if I'm not rich and God didn't choose to heal me of something? Boy, you can start feeling guilty like, man, I must not really be, I may not even be Christian. You see what I'm saying? It can cause you to doubt things that you shouldn't doubt. When somebody doesn't get rich or somebody doesn't get healed, what does that mean? It means they didn't get rich and they didn't get healed. It means nothing. You know what Job said? We sang it this morning. You give and you take away. You give and you take away. But my heart will choose to say what? Blessed to be the name of the Lord. Blessed to be the Lord. You give, you take. Who said that? Job said that. Job was one of the richest men on earth, and he became one of the poorest men on earth. But in the midst of all of it, he said, you know what? Hey, God gave it to me. God took it back. It is what it is. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His wife said, curse God and die. He said, how could I do that? He gave it to me in the first place. And here's the big one, too. Another problem with this is it creates the wrong motives. You know motives are everything, right? That's why we talk about attitude around here so much. If you really want to be right with God, look at the reasons why you do the things that you do. What is it that you don't believe about him or what is it that you do believe in yourself that causes you to act a certain way? Because this wrong motive can make service to God all about the blessings. Right? Oh, let me go serve God so I can get, get, get. Let me get some more stuff. It's a give to get plan. Again, right? It's like an investment. It's a return on an investment. If that were true, you know what? We'd all serve Jesus. Come on, right? If that was all it took... We'd all be rolling in the green, serving Jesus as hard as we could, ain't it? You ever get this letter in the mail? You ever hear this message on TV? All right, brothers and sisters, I want you to do something for me right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you will just plant a seed, and you'll send this ministry $100, you'll get back 1000 But you got to plant the seed. Heard this message? You've been paying attention if you haven't. There's a whole lot of people believing this stuff. And more often than not, it's the poor people that are giving away their, their prescription money. The reason why I get so angry, I'm trying to control my emotions on this message because you know I really worked hard not to be an emotional preacher. My grandmother and my grandfather were victims to this ridiculous mess right here. And they didn't even have money to buy their prescriptions because they were being sold this hook, line, and sinker idea that if they kept sending money to this charlatan on TV, that God would bless them with more stuff. Now, you may not have experienced that in your own life, but they had nothing. They had nothing. They could barely eat. And this vulture was preying upon them. You know what my dad said, do? All right, well, tell them this. Hey, if that works, you call them and say, I'll tell you what, you send me the $100, I'll send you back the 1000 That's my way of thinking. Joseph's with me. He's like, yeah, I already got their stewards. You, beat, you didn't beat me to that, right? Hey, guess what? They ain't going to send you that $100. You can believe that. There's this theory that you can create some kind of a binding contract with God. Like God's got these divine IOUs out there. Listen, man, that doesn't, you can't obligate God to anything. God doesn't owe us anything. We have what he's given to us. He gives, he takes away, and all of that, we've got to be able to look at it and say, you know what, blessed be the Lord. Blessed be his name. He gave it to me in the first place. I came in dust, I'll leave in dust. We don't pull the strings. Don't ever think you can pull the strings with God. You can't. You know what the difference between tithing and seed planting is? Tithing is initiated by God. Right? Seed planting is initiated by man. Tithing deals with what you have. Seed planting deals with what you want. God says be faithful, be good stewards with what you've got because you're responsible for it. Seed planting is all about trying to get more. Am I right so far? Let's apply this. Poverty theology, poverty theology says this, care for the poor. Should we care for the poor? 
Are you kidding me? Have you paid attention to how we operate around here and what it is that we do? That's why we exist. We exist to care for people who can't care for themselves and help people better care for themselves who need help in getting further along in life. That's what we exist to do here. Is that a fair statement for us as Gun Branch Church? Yes, it is. Whether they be local, regional, or international, we're doing everything we can to try to reach into people's lives and make their lives better. But not through entitlement and not through enabling, but through teaching. That's what we're trying to do. Prosperity theology doesn't say care for the poor as much as it says be a channel of blessings. Is that a fair statement? Well, yeah. Should we be a caring for the poor and should we be a channel of blessings to the people in our lives? Yes, we should. Both of these are great at face value. But stewardship takes the best of both and it leaves out the rest. It doesn't ask you what you gave up or what you'll do with what you get. Stewardship asks a different question. It asks, what are we going to do with what we have? I'm going to encourage you to do something. When you begin looking at these different points of view, and let me say this again. Don't, give, don't thump your Bible at me, man. Everybody's preaching out of the Bible. You know they are. That's a, that, that's a catchphrase for I'm lazy and I don't want to really explain to you why I believe what I believe. Oh, we just preach the Bible at our church. Yeah, so does every other church. Why aren't they all the same? You follow what I'm saying? Do we preach the Bible here? Yes, we do. Could somebody else claim that and say something totally different? They do. They can you know why that's so? Because whether we mean to or not, we go into it looking for something that we've already predisposed in our mind. We've made up our mind what we want to find, and we keep looking until we find it. That's why that happens to us. It happens to everybody. Right? So don't give me the whole, uh, you know, we just teach the Bible at our church thing. I'm sick of hearing that. You know what it's like? You're going to be inundated with other messages, I hope. I hope that you're appraising things. I hope that you're constantly hearing spiritual messages from God from different avenues. I want that for you. So here's what you do. Same thing when you come here on Sunday. Take what is said to you in any venue as a big, raw chicken. Right? Big old, raw chicken. Now, you throw the whole chicken in the pot. You cook it up. Now, I'm all about taking care of what you got. My mama said if she put it on the plate, whatever, you got to eat it. But praise God, my mama didn't put all the parts of the chicken on my plate. There's some parts of the chicken we didn't eat. Now, she may pick the meat off of it to make, you know, giblet gravy or something, but there's parts of the chicken we didn't eat in our house. We didn't eat the feet. We didn't eat the necks. We didn't eat the beaks, right? But if you're a beak eater, knock yourself out. But what do you have to do? You have to have enough discernment in and of yourself to take this raw chicken, take from it what you need in order to feed yourself, and throw out the rest. All truth's God's truth, and it can come from the most amazing and strange of means. What's the message for today? What are we doing right now with what we have? It's a simple issue, and it's the one that we've got to settle before we get to the real nuts and bolts of this series next week. And here, let me say this. It's not about what you're going to do when Aunt Hannah dies and leaves you $442,000. <laughs> you ever had that? Well, if I won the lottery, I'd hook the church up. <laughs> If Aunt Bridget happens to kick off anytime soon, man, we're going to build us a gym. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're just kind of kicking back. No, we're going to get back with you. Look, I ain't giving nothing now, but as soon as Aunt Bridget kicks the bucket, look here, we're going to hook y'all up. Well, what's the problem with that? When Aunt Bridget does kick the bucket, you don't have a practice. and You don't have, and then that's going to come, you're going to need every penny of that to do whatever it is in your own life. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what God has given you, identify it, and then identify what it is you're doing with it. Because listen to me, I'm going to ask Jacob to begin playing a little bit of music, and then I'm going to ask the team to come in just a moment. We're finished. But I, w I want you to hear this. Um, let's pray first. Father God, you're good. Help us to see the things that you've given us and help us to be better stewards with it. Help us to love you and help us to do so by being obedient to you, doing what you've asked us to do. That it's about more than just keeping the lights on in the church. It's about more than just paying salaries or having money to feed people. It's really not about that. Those are a counter 
product, they're a byproduct of the real reason, which is we give back to you because we love you. God, help us to learn these principles so that, yes, those bills do get paid, the lights do get to stay on, the salaries do get to get, be paid, but that's not why we give. We give because you've given to us. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. People will put a lot of pressure on you. I will never do that. But here's what God isn't saying. God isn't asking you to do anything with what you don't have yet. God's not asking you to do anything with what you used to have. He's asking you to do something with what you have right now. And here's the thing. This idea that we're giving to God, we're not. I know we say that. When we say it, we mean it well. It's not like we mean to get that wrong, but we're not really giving to God. To give to God would say that it's ours. What are we really doing? We're returning to God a percentage of what it is that he's given to us. Is there a difference? There is a difference in my mind. Because if it's mine, I get to choose what I do with it. Where's my control? Where's my choice? Where's my dependence? What am I choosing to serve? But if it's God and he's just allowing me to manage it, then it's all his. And I'm going to be accountable. Next week we're going to talk about the stewards and the talents and the things that God gives us and what we do with what he gives us. And I'm afraid it's going to convict y'all as much as it's convicted me in preparing it because we have a lot of this stinking thinking in our theology and we don't realize it. And in fairness to us, we're bombarded with it. Right? So just spend this week. We'll give you a moment right now just to reflect. What has God given you? I see some of you hugging up to your spouses right now. That's a good thing. God's given me the best wife in the world. You know? That's a good thing. He's given me some great kids. He's given me the air in my my lungs, the ability to live, the ability to work, the ability to be born in America. Praise God. I didn't get to choose these things. God just did these things for me. He looked past all my faults and all my sins, and he saw me as something that was potential. When everybody else just saw a wretch, a drug dealer, an idiot, a, a fake, a phony, a threat to their child, and they were all right. But God saw me, and he saw something in me that no one else saw. And because of that, he was willing to give me things that nobody else has ever been able to give me, and nobody else will ever be able to give it to me again. I am a child of the king, and I'm a child of the king because he chose me. I have been chosen by God, and he has given me everything. And I forget it all the time. All the time I forget it. What's he giving you? Is he giving you health? Has he given you great relationships? Has he given you a circle of influence full of people that look to you in one way or the other for answers in their life? Has he given you a job? Has he given you loved ones? Has he given you life? Right? What's he giving you? And based on that, what are you returning to him? Because it's all his anyway. 